I'm here to talk about translation and particularly translation studies. My title is How General is Translation? And that should be, I think, a no-brainer. If this is the plenary that brings together people from all these separate language sessions in linguistics, language teaching, and, and literature, translation is presumably something that is in some way common to all. Uh, my question, though, how general, has more to do with the relationship between translation studies as an academic discipline, especially as established in the United States, no, in the European Union and in Canada, in places that require translation for their governance. These are multilingual policies, okay? Uh, in the United States, things are very, very different. There are just a few traditional centers that train high-level translators and interpreters. Uh, there's been an exclusion of translation from uh, second language teaching because of communicative methods and immersion ideologies. And the idea of, of, of translation as an object of study has been picked up more recently by departments of comparative literature and especially now world literature, which are giving it a, a very high-powered theorization that it hasn't had in the European-Canadian tradition that I represent. So that's my question. I come bringing to you a discipline that has been developed elsewhere, and the question is, do you want any of it? If so, where could it fit in? And how can we learn from what's being done with translation in this country, which is quite different? All that, in, in less than 40 minutes, it's going to be a bit of a whirlwind tour. Now, you've had ample time to construe that sentence up there. I hope you've had a good go at it. Okay, It's from the world's highest paid professor of English, so he should be able to write English, we would assume. But it is a, the kind of uh, sentence I've been trying to construe because in Homi Baba's book, The Location of Culture, 1994, uh, we have one of the most powerful presentations of generalized translation, which is called in that book, Cultural Translation. So that's why I would come to terms with that. And the sentence looks sort of interesting for me because it's about an academic discipline and what academic disciplines tend to do. Now, you might recognize the sentence because it was runner-up. It didn't win. The runner-up in the philosophy and literature bad writing contest. Uh, 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 Judith Butler won that year. Okay. So. Now... In Baba, we find that cultural translation, as he calls it, can be anything that is due to displacement, especially the displacement of people. A lot of this book is concerned with migrations and uh, uh, <laughs> bits of cultural objects that have been displaced. I have this superb example <laughs> of cultural translation right next to me here with these columns, which should be holding something up, but it's <laughs> It reminds me of, of uh, the universities in Australia in the 1890s when they were getting classical studies going and they looked around them in Australia and found nothing and said, well, we have to build some ancient ruins. We've put a public subscription to get the ancient ruins built. We, we've, we've got the ruins imported here with us. Okay. So that would be cultural translation in the most general sense. But we find phrases like this, uh, the new, uh, the insurgent, Translation, this displacement from one place to the other, is one of the mechanisms by which newness is created. The other in this book is actually blasphemy, the, the transgression of moral and cultural boundaries as well. Other phrases there, the borderline condition, anything that concerns a border is susceptible to attract this term cultural translation, and of course hybridity, and the tracing of hybridity is all attributed to this term translation, which has rather a lot of responsibility to bear in that book. What it is, I don't know, because there is no clear definition, only these usages, but this has been very influential in the United States academic discourse, especially in 
comparative and world literature. There we go. The one thing I can extract from this, and it's not me, uh, people have called Homi Baba's uh, use of translation non-substantive. Uh, this was a conversation with Harish Trivedi, another Indian uh, scholar, and Baba sort of agreed, yes. Uh, and I would rewrite that as, these are usages of translation that don't require any start text or source text. It differs from the kind of translation I've been doing for many years, because usually I've got a text there that I'm trying to do something with. Uh, the usages of cultural translation simply do away with the text and have a lot of the fun, the process, the dialogue, the dilemmas uh, that, that are more on the level of ideology rather than the quite tedious process of getting down and actually translating a text, which I'm afraid is very hard work. Now, when I try to bring that notion across to the translation studies I've been doing, I have two problems. Uh, one is that it's, as I said, hard work. It's not that general. I'll give you an example here. We've been carrying out um, a large-scale project on mediation strategies, particularly those of migrants and asylum seekers in Europe, of which there are many at the moment. And we've been doing basic social linguistic research, going into uh, migrant centers or, or where the asylum seekers are. They're called detention centers. I'm, I'm trying to avoid that term, but that's what they are. And we see how they communicate when not enough Europeans know the languages concerned, uh, Arabic, Pashto, whatever. And um, we find that there's a preference not to use translations, translators or interpreters. Okay, Where they're ideologically, we train translators and interpreters. We want them to be useful. We want them to get in there and help people. And we find these people saying, no, I don't want an interpreter here to help me. I'm going to do it myself. I'll use Google Translate or whatever. They'll use translation, free online machine translation. But that is used as a pedagogical tool. Mm -hmm. And with that and with, hen with friends, they'll work on uh, the use of a lingua franca, commonly English, or intercomprehension, that is bilingual conversations, when, one when you have passive knowledge of the other person's language, or, or above all, language learning. They are the most interested in moving in to the dominant host languages and therefore reject often the translation services that are offered to them. Bah. I've got this great theory that says translation is part of everything that's going on in their experience, and then I've got this practical social linguistic research that shows that many other things are going on and that translation in the narrow sense with a text to work on is not as general as the theory would have it. That's one of my problems. With that, I go back to the kind of translation studies that I've been doing. And it's, I'll just present a series of terms. We divide translation up between the written and the spoken, translation and inter interpretation in this country, and audiovisual studies, which are there as well. We divide the source from the source or start text from the target text. We can have parallel texts. These are texts like the target text that are in the same text type and genre in the target language. We can have pseudo-translations, texts that look like translations, but are not really because there is no start text. You can have a pseudo-original. I'm not going to give you a lesson on this. I just want to show you that we've done a lot of work on a whole lot of concepts. That's just a few of them. Okay? Oh, it slipped down. The equivalence has to be up there. We've got this way of explaining a whole bunch of texts. In the middle there, we've got a way of explaining a whole lot of things that translators can do. And on the right, we've got different kinds of equivalence. We've got the relationship with the client. And then we have ideas about the effects of translations on cultures. This is the retranslation, law of interference, law of standardization. 
okay, and then uh, a set of proposed universals of translation. I'm just summarizing on one page about 30 years of intellectual work. Okay? We've been doing stuff. <laughs> okay. And the skills there um, would be, a lot of it came from descriptive translation studies on the, on, on, on the left. In the center, it goes back to Vinay Dabulne and work on, uh, on, on, on solution types, then Skopos theory, and then advanced descriptive studies going into universals theory. Okay. This is my cultural baggage. This is what I'm bringing in to that problem. Prior to 1950, that meta-language was not in place. It's a recent invention in those terms. The concepts, all of them, have been developed in European languages and for translation between European languages. This is a very European-Canadian enterprise. Okay? And from 1990, when these various schools were at least in touch with each other without agreeing on everything, it's possible to talk about translation studies as a discipline and about a translation studies approach to research on translations. And since then, we've had a whole lot of different turns, but I don't like that much. I'm not going to go into it. And in the past, what, three or four years, I, well, I don't know what it is in, in your part of the academic world, but we've got all these handbooks coming out, little encyclopedias and handbooks, about 12 of them which is rather a lot because it somehow assumes that there's a stable body of knowledge that can be packed into a guide for, for newcomers. Um, I've, I've lived through that process, and I would think that from within it is, it is anything but stable, anything but proven. However, there it is, uh, decades of work, uh, apparently stabilized uh, outwardly. No discipline develops autonomously, independently. If I look there, I see that all those terms have spatial metaphors, as do the terms for translation in European languages. Okay, the uh, translation <coughs> is to go trans across from one side to the other. Übersetzen, to take it over and sit, sit it down. Überliefen, if you like, as well. Traduction, traduction, uh, uh, it, it's, it's to try to lead, somebody was talking about that, the ductus, ductus, okay, the, to lead across. All these spatial metaphors underlie the way we talk about translation in this tradition. There are other terms, though, that come from mathematics, the whole discourse on equivalence, and still others, just a few, from music. And uh, we could pursue the metaphorical drawing across from one discipline to another in other fields as well. It's a hybrid creation, uh, which nevertheless seems to work. Some of the main movements, however, that have, in this development have come through something that Baba does name as bringing newness into the world, blasphemy. Saying the thing that cannot be said. Or in this case, especially Gideon Turi, whom you have here, saying the opposite of what everybody else is saying. I'll give you some examples. It was thought, let's say, through to the 1970s, that research on translation should tell people how to translate. Sounds a reasonably practical goal, doesn't it? Turi comes up and says, no, nope, we're going to describe what translators actually do. And from that, we have accumulated an enormous number of descriptions so that we are tremendously aware of the diversity of what translation is for different people, different genres, different epochs, different cultures. Orthodoxy, we should start from the start text or the source text. I use both terms. I, I use start text, actually, but still. Uh, text de départ, Ausgangs text, text de partida, right? right. You're going to study translation, you look and see what's there. Turing said, no, no thank you. I'm going to start from the other side and see what people construe a translation as in the space of arrival. Because then I'll know what translation is doing in their language and culture. At the same time, this is in the 1980s, 
Scopos theory in Germany through Hans Vermeer said, we are also going to start from the target side and the target purpose. And forget about what the source text function is, we're going to see what translations have to do in the place of arrival. These were blasphemous things in their day and the cause of great debate. All these things are now well accepted in the discipline. Orthodoxy, there is an optimal way to translate. Heterodoxy, no. It's culturally uh, relative and all we can discover are the various norms that show how people should translate in particular places. Orthodoxy, we tra train translators, therefore, to apply these norms and do well according to expectations. Gideon Turi, who loved to argue, uh, would say, no, 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 I'm going to train translators to break norms so we can get new forms and discover even better ways of translating. There were problems that were overcome through major acts of borrowing. I've just mentioned one of them. But the problem was that descriptive translation studies, uh, which is being done in Europe, particularly in the smaller cultures and languages, you might know the smaller the culture and language, the greater the role of translations in it, Okay, which is why it was done in Europe, in Israel, especially in this case here. Uh, the problem was that these isolated observations couldn't really fit together to form any one view or overarching theory, and they couldn't produce a pedagogy. Turi's solution was obviously to import norms just straight from quite behaviorist sociology, bringing it across, developing through importation. Other problems, if you're aware, in a deconstructionist tradition, but you could also just be very nitpicking and analyze text, you will be aware that equivalence is difficult to establish, unless there's an overarching authority to impose it. In normal everyday language, in different cultures, it's very hard to say, ah, that is the equivalent. It happens, but not often. And yet, the users and by the people who employ translators want some kind of equivalence to some kind of text. And the solution there has been, historically, to import relevance theory uh, from pragmatics, from linguistic pragmatics, and bring that into the discipline. And that has worked as a very valid solution to that particular problem. Um, I'm doing something similar in my own work. I import a lot from risk management theory. And I just accept translators do not produce equivalents unless there's authority, but they are managing communication systems and distributing risks. And I proceed my, to do my analysis in that way, once again, trying to solve these problems by going from without, bringing stuff into a discipline. It happens the other way around occasionally. Uh, we have a lot of corpus linguistics in translation studies. I think the corpus linguistics was there because it was a cool thing to do, and then we looked around to find problems it could solve, uh, which were the so-called universals of translation, or why translational language is different from non-translational language. I won't pursue that too much. Okay, and our concepts continue to borrow because there are new problems that are coming up. Okay, uh, the purpose-based translation in the 1980s brought across Scopos from action theory, pragmatics action theory. These days we talk a lot about uh, collaborative translation. We bring in activist theory, activism theory, into, into the field. So that, that process hasn't stopped. We've reached a stage, though, where some of us feel so confident about our good work that uh, we think everybody else can and should learn from us. For example, uh, Doris Bachmann Medic here suggests that other disciplines should be taking a translational turn and that we can now deal with anything that's like a situation of global cultural encounter. Anything that concerns research practices, interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, if you've got a problem with any of those, come to us, we'll help you, apparently. I don't quite get that, but the argument is made. 
At the same time, the argument is made that within our discipline, we should be dissecting exactly what it is we're dealing with. What is this translation? And uh, Doris Blackman Medic somehow assumes that we should be experts in all these terms, transfer, mediation, metaphor, etc. I have doubts on both those fronts because I don't see that collection as, of concepts as being a stable or noble tradition. I think the turns that we've been taking in translation studies just turn back and follow around the same path. I think we're wandering around on the one restricted map, and I think we have merely been elaborating just one translation form. This is going to get heavy now, but I'll go... I'll try to explain it. Okay. All the concepts I have listed, all those terms, rest on foundational binarisms, one or the other, and the, 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 the assumption of a boundary between them. And it is very easy to undo, undo them. The binarisms are written into what we think translation is. And here is an idea of how you can define translation within our Western societies. Postulates. One, there is an anterior text. So Baba isn't doing what we do. But, you know, it, there it is. Postulate two, it's in another language. So there is a lingual alterity of some kind. Postulate three, there are tangible relationships. This is straight from Turi, the descriptive translation studies, and those relationships would be a presumption of resemblance there. The alien I, if a translator or an interpreter says, I am tired, then that person isn't tired. The speaker is tired. Okay, the I belongs to someone else. Act actors use the alien I as well. Okay, and uh, quantitative covariance, the assumption that if the source text is longer, so will the translation be longer. And that could define a translation. That's what we work on. That um, is what I'm calling the Western translational form. And that, that underlies all those spatial metaphors that we've had there and all those divisions between languages, in fact, all those terms that we've been working on. Those are false oppositions. I will prove this to you very quickly. Source versus target. All right. But when I go back and I do medieval translation studies in Spain, I'm working on Hispania, sorry, prior to Spain. Dialect chains, 12th, 13th century. Dialect chains. There were no borders between Mallorcan and Catalan and Valencian and Aragonese over into Leonese, over to... And translations moved across them in a manuscript tradition quite freely, incrementally. And there was not, not this assumption that we have today of source and target as being separate languages. So was that translation or not? Manuscript copying would constantly update the language as they went and correct it in some parts of the text where it was required. Was that translation? Not by our definitions. They were doing it. Intralingual translation is a reality. People translate from one level or register to another level. Is that translation or not? It certainly was in the medieval period when I was working there, as was updating. That division between source and target is not general. It's specific to a certain Western translation form, which is after the medieval period. In fact, begins in the Renaissance begins with print, for reasons I'm not going into right now. Complete interpretative resemblance. This is a fancy way of saying equivalence, or perhaps fidelity. All right. But we have these days, in fact, Skopos' theory in Germany was based on it, situations where a text can be translated for purposes that are quite different from the start text. Publicity is adapted to the client locale, and bits are added and taken out or explained, images are altered, the level of language, the voice is altered. There is no complete interpretative resemblance. Are we going to exclude this? 
or included in translation. I'm talking about publicity in general. Translations can be regarded as new creations. I have an example here. This is from Clive Scott, who's a professor, but also poet and translator. You have the start text over there, and you can see it's good, solid English language verse. And his translation over there is still English. This is an intralingual translation, but Clive Scott is trying to express his particular reading of this poem. It includes putting in the sounds of the birds that he imagines uh, uh, are heard around this uh, train station uh, somewhere in is isolated England. Okay, This completely breaks the very foundational norms, the foundational divisions, the splitting uh, on which we've set up translation studies. Third was quantitative invariance, how long the translation should be. Well, what do we do with translations that summarize texts, or that omit things, or that put things together? The Jesuit missionaries in China produced texts in Chinese that were fragments from various Latin texts put together with a pedagogical purpose. Each one was translated, but do I call the thing a translation or what? The maxim of quantitative variance simply doesn't apply anymore. We have many translations that explicitate and extend throughout history. Do we still want to call them translations? Then separating the written from the spoken is incredibly precarious. Tra interpreters do a thing that's called sight translation, for example. You get a written text and you verbalize it. You translate verbally. What is it? It's written and spoken at the same time. We have speech-to-text subtitles automatically produced and corrected. We have collaborative translations um, moving between the spoken, the written, and the... I, I, I won't go into the technologies. Um, but, for example, in depositions... Uh, somebody will be speaking, there is a transcript made of it, and the interpreter can have that transcript simultaneously on their screen and will work from the written transcript, because that is what counts. That's the valid text. So we have spoken, written, spoken, all in the same act. This division between translation and interpreting completely fails, uh, just in terms of the technologies we have available to us today. Um, it also obviously fails when you go back to preprint cultures and epic recitative traditions where literature was spoken and translations were spoken with this orality uh, which doesn't conform to our translation norms. I'll skip that. That kind of oral translation is found today in many parts of the world. This is from South Sudan. In the courts, where we have the figure of the Agamlong, the reporter of speech, the one who makes quiet voices louder. So it's actually somebody who picks up what's said and repeats it so everybody can hear. Um, the Occupy Wall Street movement had things similar, uh, people repeating. You know. uh, but when necessary, they would also change language. And when necessary, they will add an explanation. There are no divisions between those practices, as indeed we find in the, the Arabic tradition, in, in the very word used for translation, tajama, which can mean to bring out the meaning of, to make it clear, to explain while something happens, to convey speech, interpreting, to transfer speech from one language to another, to give a title to a book, to write or narrate someone's biography. Now, that is general and far more general than the sense of translation that we've been using in our concepts. So, my proposal here is that we in European translation studies have a lot to learn from where our concepts run aground. And it runs aground when we test it on these other situations and other usages of the kind that 
that many of you work on, since you are in many centuries, in many languages, working on many, many parts of the world. We have to take the splits that we made and rethink them. For example, we become aware that the act of translation, if you look at it in terms of orality, is not just one thing. It's a language change for us, yes. But then it's the act of retelling. And a lot of the things that we find or think we find in translation studies, for example, explicitation, we find that translators tend to explicitate, tend to help the reader by adding things. Okay, We've, It's a universal... No, it's not a universal translation, because people who work, work on narrativity, on the retelling, find the same thing. So we should go back to our concepts and say, look, we're looking at the act of retelling, and all that involves, and, apart from that, or in addition, the fact of the language change. There is a split, but it can be, the cake, cake can be cut up in different ways. Another example of the same thing, a lot of translating these days is done in, on that sort of interface on your computer where you've got a, a machine translation feed and your translation memory feed coming in. You've got your start text on the left in fragments or segmented and your job as a translator is to correct or repair the proposals that come up from the databases in the little screen on the right there, the center column there. Here, translation becomes something quite different. It becomes the fact of segmentation, which all our technologies are doing, but we haven't really come to terms with the cognitive effects of that, and the language change, but that's happening in the machines, on the work on the algorithms and databases, and then the process of human repair, which we call post-editing. And this is a form of translation that has come to be dominant within the contemporary translation technologies. The split is quite different. My third example is rather more complex and historical. It seems to me, as I said, that the Western translation form was born of the Renaissance, a combination of individuality, property over text, and print culture, when money started to circulate for property over text. I won't go into that. I just observe that many historians, of whom you have a few here and here, note that a fundamental shift in the concept of translation occurred in these parts of the world, mostly in the later decades of the 19th century and into the 20th century, very roughly occurring with the arrival of steam technology, that is, train lines and the printing press. That is, if you like, modernity. Translation, the Western translation form, traveled as a companion of modernity. Out into parts of the world that embraced it for many, many reasons. Part of modernity was the cheap availability of text, of knowledge, the possibility of public education, the need to have knowledge in your languages for that education, therefore the quite massive need for translation projects based on the Western norm of equivalence or fidelity to a fixed text. Uh, now, the paradox here is that some of the foremost Western theorists now want us to incorporate the non-Western ideas of translation, of which there are many, like the Arabic extension that I, I just presented to you, uh, and lament, in so doing, the imposition and the, the poverty of the Western concept of translation. The paradox is that just as they do that, as they, in their translation concepts, want to privilege the foreign over the domestic, uh, to to, to change the way we think about translation. These other cultures have accepted the Western concept and are citing these precise people and translating these precise people into their languages. Okay, my, my main work here is, is, is on Southeast Asian languages and, and Chinese especially. <clears throat> 
adopting wholeheartedly the Western theorists and the Western concepts, even more so when they are criticizing Western tradition. Makes it just so much the better. Okay. But they're coming from a tradition and thinking in terms of, 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 a, of a mode of thought where the source language is worth more than the target language. And this mode of thought would be familiar to any of you in the medieval period when languages, some were closer to God, were closer to divine revelation. Okay, what's the best language? Hebrew, Sanskrit for some. Greek and Latin had the Bible by divine inspiration in them. Then you would get down to the national vernaculars and then the patois, and translation would move down on this hierarchy of languages, bringing down knowledge and developing the less developed languages. The Renaissance did away with that entirely. Leonardo Bruni declared that all national vernaculars were equal and as good as each other. But when you move out of Europe and Canada or the United States, when you move out and see what is happening uh, with translations in many, many parts of the world, you're back to that hierarchy where it comes from a more developed language into a less developed language. Follow computer technology and you'll see what I mean. What this means, of course, is that the very discipline I represent, Western translation studies, has been calced on a particular form of translation. That form traveled, and we have followed it, perhaps with two or three generations delay, but we have followed in its footsteps, and we have been part of that spread and even imposition of modernity, for better or for worse. And now, because of our feeling of guilt, with myself and the theorists I've just named, we feel a need to go beyond that form and to redress the splits that we imposed on the rest of the world. The roots of desire, our desire to explain, our desire to understand, our desire to embrace all knowledge, that's universities are for, after all, can explain the way the discipline developed with its guilt, justification, pseudoscientific theories, all those things I listed there, spurious authorities, countless spurious authorities, and classifications and reclassifications. In a desire to normalize the discipline and to make it look coherent in those handbooks that are being written as I speak. All that is disturbed by this discourse of splitting that splits it one way and then it can be split another. And that's the task we have to do now in translation studies, is to go back to those very fundamental concepts and redo the basic splitting that we did. Violating, yes, violating the very rationalism on which we were founded and the enlightened claims of our enunciatory modality. Thank you very much.